A second round of ceasefire negotiations between Russia and Ukraine began this Thursday in Belarus. Argentina's government completed negotiations with the International Monetary Fund over the debt inherited from former President Mauricio Macri. The value of crude oil reached its highest since 2003. Hi, this is from the South Timer News Anchor Dio Martin from the Telstar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. The second round of ceasefire negotiations between Russia and Ukraine began this Thursday in Belarus. Russian and Ukrainian delegations held their second round of talks since the start of Moscow's military operation after the Belarusian region of Gomel hosted a first contact on Monday, which lasted for five hours. On this occasion, the talks are held in the best region near the border with Poland. Russia's foreign ministry stated they hope to bring about an end to the situation, restore peace in Donbass, and enable all people in Ukraine to return to peaceful life. After the first round of negotiations, both delegations left for their respective capitals to consult with their presidents. Now with a clearer picture of the demands and common interests of both nations, the delegations are resuming negotiations in order to seek solutions to the conflict. On Thursday, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave a press conference to Russian and foreign media in Moscow. He condemned the censorship that Europe and the United States exercise on the Russian media to distort what is happening in Ukraine. The U.S. are trying to close any news media, any source of Russian information on what is happening in Ukraine, on the progress of the special military operation, and how the Ukrainian troops and nationalist armed groups are behaving. Likewise, the Russian foreign minister denounced that the government of Vladimir Zelensky allowed the proliferation of neo-Nazi and ultranationalist groups in Ukraine. Zelensky may be presiding a society where neo-Nazis flourish. They stage public marches and President Zelensky offers them his guard of honor to protect those marches. They educate them and train them to wage war in cities. And all of this is happening under the government of President Zelensky. The Russian currency, the ruble, has experienced a serious depreciation at Moscow's stock exchange while the dollar and the euro set record high values. The ruble plummeted more than 40 percent this week, even though Moscow's stock exchange has remained inactive for the last three years due to the economic sanctions by Western powers. At the present in Moscow, one dollar trades for 116.6 rubles and the euro stands at a 124.75 rubles on the eighth day of the military operation in Ukraine. On Saturday, the leaders of the European Commission, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, Canada and the United States reiterated their strong condemnation of the military operation that Russia has been carrying out since February 24th in Ukraine and proceeded with sanctions like the embargo of Russian assets at the Central Bank in Europe and the disconnection of a series of banks from the SWIFT international payment system. Six hundred and twelve Ukrainian military infrastructure facilities have been destroyed by Russian troops since the beginning of the special military operation in the Donbass region, according to the latest report by the Russian Defense Ministry. Russia's Defense Ministry spokesman General Igor Konoshenkov said Thursday that Russian troops have also rendered useless a technological cluster located in Kiev, which was allegedly being used by the Ukrainian Security Service for psychological operations against Moscow. Konoshenkov also reported that they have already destroyed 49 car aircrafts on the ground, plus another 13 in the air, as well as 606 tanks and other armored ve fighting vehicles, 67 multiple rocket launchers, 227 field artillery pieces and mortars, in addition to 405 special military vehicles and 53 drones. Furthermore, Konoshenkov said the Russian armed forces have taken control over Kistopoli, Novodvorsky, and Nishvodnyi. In total, during the operation, 1,612 military sites were hit, including 62 command and communication posts of the Ukrainian army, 39 S-300 Buck M-1 and OSA air defense missile systems, and 52 radar stations. Also, 49 planes were destroyed on the ground, in addition to 13 planes destroyed in midair, 606 tanks and other types of combat armor vehicles, 67 rocket launchers, 227 artillery weapons and mortars, 405 special military vehicles and 53 unmanned aerial vehicles have been destroyed. And China urged the United States to reflect upon its role in the Ukrainian crisis and take concrete actions to ease tensions and solve problems. How the Ukrainian issue evolved to the current situation is clear, and we all know the crux of the issue. George F. Kennan, the former U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, advised 
the U.S. government in the 1990s, but the continued expansion of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization against Russia would be the most fatal mistake in U.S. policy. It is a pity that the U.S. government turned a deaf ear to his counsel. Thomas Loren Friedman, a famous U.S. political commentator on international issues, published an article recently pointing out that the U.S. government should bear a great deal of responsibility for the deterioration of relations with Russia caused by its major decision-making mistakes on NATO eastward expansion. Tulsi Gabbard, former member of the U.S. House of Representatives, said the crisis could have easily been ended and the war could have been avoided if the Biden administration promises not to let Ukraine into NATO, but they didn't. In Venezuela, President Nicolas Maduro stressed that the main form of war of the United States against the Russian Federation is through the imposition of sanctions with the aim of destabilizing the economy of the Eurasian giant. Because the main form of war in the world is not the military one. I want to say it in relation to the Ukrainian conflict. The main war in the world is economic, financial, commercial. It is the indiscriminate illegal use of the dollar currency of the financial system by the United States and Europe to harm the countries of the world, to blackmail the world. Look at what they are doing with Russia. It is a crime what they are doing against the Russian people. Also in Venezuela, President Nicolas Maduro denounced the Western media campaign against Russia, which led to the censorship of several media outlets in the Eurasian nation. We condemn the whole media campaign. Look what they've done with Russia today and Sputnik. They, who claim to be defenders of freedom of speech, have been in the United States and in Europe and in digital platforms, the Russia Today and Sputnik Media International channels. What are they afraid of? If they believe they are right and true, if they believe they have the power, what are they afraid of? That Americans and Europeans will learn the truth from Russia Today and Sputnik? They are very weak, they are very weak because they know that a critical public opinion has been developing in the United States and in Europe. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, welcome back to From the South. Argentina's government completed negotiations with the International Monetary Fund over the debt narrative from former President Mauricio Macri. The bill is expected to go to the Chamber of Deputies for approval next Thursday. Government authorities affirmed that with the new scenario of extended facilities for the payment of the debt until 2026, the situation will be controlled and measured by the usual contributions to the agency. The Argentinian government negotiates to refinance a loan of more than $44 billion granted by the agency in 2018. The IMF imposed on Argentina the payment of $18 billion this year and another $19 billion in 2023, a horizon that the government considers impossible to meet. In Colombia, a crisis in the prison system breaks after prison privileges granted to individuals linked to the national government are made public. The crisis has been prompted after the public release of a video showing deta detained businessman Carlos Matos leaving La Picota prison in Bogota to meet with his agent and lawyer, Levan Cancino. Matos was being accompanied by officials from the National Penitentiary Institute. Also on Wednesday, we learned that the director of this institute, General Mariano Botero Coy, and the director of La Picota prison, Wilmer Valencia, have been removed from their posts. It should be noted that the defense team of Matos is also in charge of such cases like that of lawyer Diego Chain, under investigation for allegedly manipulating witnesses to favor former President Alvaro Uribe, who presumably has left the country despite being under house arrest. Belize holds the fourth CARICOM SICA summit to strengthen strategic relations among member states. The meeting is aimed at bringing together leaders of the Caribbean community and members of the Central American Integration System to strengthen multi sectoral relations and should include commitments by the countries to strengthen foreign policy consultation and active collaboration on socio economic development issues, including tourism, trade, and investments. In Cuba, the Casa del Alba Cultural Center in Havana is hosting a tribute to the revolutionary leader and former president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez Frias, on the occasion of the ninth anniversary of his physical departure. The tribute began with a panel called Chavez por Siempre, where those present were able to share anecdotes and emotions with Professor, professor Adán Chavez, ambassador of Venezuela in Cuba. The Chavez por Siempre Day will continue with other activities such as the screening of the documentary La Siembra and the presentation of the book Venezuela, La Menaza que yo conocí by the Cuban author Berta Mojena Milian. 
Hugo Chavez Frias passed away on March 5, 2013, leaving an immense legacy for the Venezuelan Latin American people by advocating for regional unity, social justice, anti-imperialism, sovereignty, and the struggle for the independence of the people of the continent. Chavez is a reference for the struggles of all our peoples, especially here in our Americas, and this struggles for freedom and sovereignty, to consolidate revolutions that already exist, and for the people to take power where they have not yet done so. Chavez's projects, and we have to say it, is like Fidel's. The Cuban Revolution and the Bolivarian Revolution complement each other. And in Honduras, family members and social and human rights organizations just as six years after the murder of activist Berta Cáceres. The environmentalist and indigenous leader Berta Cáceres was murdered in her home in the Western Department of Honduras on March 3, 2016. Berta was one of the founders of the Civic Council of Popular and Indigenous Organizations and led demonstrations in defense of the environment, opposing the construction of hydroelectric projects in the west of her country on some fields where natural resources were threatened. She was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize, the world's highest recognition for environmentalists, where she denounced that she was persecuted and threatened with her life as a result of her struggle. Family members, social organizations demand justice in view of state of impunity. President of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, received this Wednesday outside of his official agenda, the former president of Brazil, Ignacio Lula da Silva. The visit takes place in the context of elections in Brazil to be held on the 2nd of October, and Lula leads the polls and is the only figure who can defeat Jair Bolsonaro. The leader, the leader of the Workers' Party included in his agenda meetings with local media at breakfast with the Mexican Arab state and a speech during the meeting of legislators of the ruling party on Wednesday night. There, Lula said that he had made a commitment to López Obrador to consolidate the relationship between Mexico and Brazil. In Brazil, when we defend the interests of the poor people, we are called radicals. When we defend the interests of women and LGBT community, the black people, the indigenous population, when we defend the correct environmental policy because it is not possible to develop the world without taking care of the environment, nobody treats us with the dignity we deserve. We have received a lot of criticism and today they do not want us to return to power. And I am going to tell you something. Be assured that if I win the elections, I will come here this year to consolidate the most important political relationship between Brazil and Mexico. That will happen in 2023. Now, about 350 asylum seekers managed on Thursday to cross a high border fence separating Spain's Melilla enclave from Morocco after a group of people tried to climb over the enclosure for a second consecutive day. The incident occurred a day after an unprecedented 2,000 and 500 people made a mass run at the border with almost 500 getting across in what the Spanish government's local delegation said was the biggest entry attempt on record. A delegation spokesman said in a statement that Thursday's incident began when Spanish police noted an extremely large group of people approaching the fence. After overcoming the Moroccan security forces, they began to jump the fence, throwing stones and using hooks and sticks against the security forces. Initial reports confirmed four members of the Guardia Civil Police were hurt in the attempt. We have more news coming up after the show break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. Benchmark Brent crude oil prices climbed close to $120 a barrel on Thursday with Russian oil experts disrupted as traders try to avoid becoming entangled in sanctions. Support also came from United States crude stockpiles at multi-year lows, helping to lift Brent crude futures for the highest level since 2012. Brent has jumped about 37% in the past 30 days and the contract's six-month spread hit a record high on Thursday at more than $20 a, $21 a barrel, uh, uh, indicating very tight supplies. Russia competes with Saudi Arabia for the title of biggest crude oil and refined oil products exporter with shipments of more than 7 million barrels per day, about half of which go to Europe. While wielding economic sanctions to try to make Moscow call off its military operation in Ukraine, Washington has so far stopped short of targeting Russia's oil and gas experts weighing the impact on global oil markets and U.S. energy prices. The Burkina Faso 2050 Consortium, a civil society group, demonstrated in the capital against a railway concession given to the French Bolloré Group. 
activists marched from the Bataille du Rail roundabout to the Ministry of Transport via the Bellore Logistics site. There were also pr other protests in locations across the country, such as El Cedrail or government offices in Bobadilla Sioux and other major urban areas. There has been increased hostility toward the long-term presence of the French military across the Sahel region, including in Burkina Faso in recent months. French business interests may also meet a corresponding uptick in local scrutiny in the weeks and months ahead. A bomb exploded near a police van in southwestern Pakistan, killing an officer and another person and injuring seven passers-by. According to a senior police officer, the attack took place in Kata, the capital of Baluchistan province. No one immediately claimed responsibility for the bombing, but previous such attacks have been blamed on the Pakistani Taliban and several insurgent groups. Baluchistan has been the scene of a long-running insurgency by Baluch secessionist groups that for decades have staged bombings and shooting attacks on civilians and security forces to press their demands for independence. The Pakistani Taliban and the Islamic State group have also a presence in Baluchistan for some time. When the police mobile van was crossing in this area, suddenly a blast happened. So far, our assessment is two to two and a half kilograms of explosive material were used in this blast. In the report, at the moment, what we have so far is three murdered, including one of our officers, Inspector Ahmad Naved and the blast has wounded 18 others, including two of our policemen. Authorities in Australia issued more orders for people to leave their homes on Thursday after heavy rain triggered flash floods in its largest city, with officials warning of worse to come and some 500,000 people likely to face orders to evacuate. Australia's east coast has been battered by a severe weather system that has cut off entire towns and submerged hundreds of homes and farms as it has moved south from Queensland state over the past week. Thirteen people have been killed since the flood began a week ago. The second year of flooding came as a La Nina weather pattern, typically associated with increased, increased rainfall, has dominated Australia's east coast over the summer. Rivers and catchments were already near capacity before the latest drenching after steady rains over the last few weeks. And five people died in the Indonesian city, city of Sarang due to torrential rain that caused widespread flooding. Sarang is in the province of Banten in the Indonesian main island of Java. For the last two days, the center of the city has been submerged. As a result, nearly 4,000 houses have been flooded and 700 residents have been evacuated. Banten police has set up several evacuation tents and public kitchens for the evacuees. A special session of the UN Environment Assembly commemorated the 50th anniversary of its creation. The commemoration comes a day after passing a key resolution to start negotiating an international treaty to ban plastic pollution. The resolution covers the entire life cycle of plastic and could introduce new rules on production, redesigning of products for easier recycling, sustainable use, and better waste disposal. It also calls for financial assistance to help poorer countries take action. UNEP has transformed into a formidable ecological consciousness for the world as it boldly championed the environment agenda. Progressively, over the last 50 years, UNEP has led the world to understand the centrality of environment in human existence, to appreciate the increased threats to the environment as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Environment Program's existence, we load the efforts of the United Nations Environment Program and encourage broader action to outcome climate change, biodiversity, rise in levels of pollution and waste being three major crises threatening our planet. Firefighters on the ground and on air battled a smoky wildfire in Southern California's Cleveland National Forest. The fire was reported in the Holy Jim Trail area, and by nightfall, it had consumed about 200 hectares of br uh, brush along steep slopes. National Forest officials said forward progress had slowed by Wednesday afternoon. About 100 firefighters were dispatched with air tankers and helicopters, dropping water and retardant on the blaze named the Jim's Fire. So far, no structures were threatened. The fire sent up a huge plume of smoke visible across Orange County, southeast of Los Angeles, and beyond. 
It erupted on the last day of a winter heat wave with temperatures above 29 degrees Celsius and very dry humidity levels. We've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at Closer English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tulsa English, I'm Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.